Hi, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to uh, the kickoff panel discussion for Safer Streets, Stronger Economies. My name is Alex Dodds. I'm the Communications Director here at Smart Earth America. And we're very excited to have you all here, uh, both listening and joining us from near and far uh, for the kickoff discussion about today's new report. Uh, we're going to be discussing research that was unveiled this morning on our website. You can download a full copy of our findings at smartgrowthamerica.org slash safer-streets-strongereconomies, uh, or you can uh, visit our homepage. You can see it there too at smartgrowthamerica.org. Um, we've got a great panel of speakers who are going to be talking about today's findings. First, we're going to uh, hear a little bit about the context for this report and why we did this research. Uh, to talk about that, we're going to hear from Governor Paris Glenn Denning, President of Smart Growth America's Leadership Institute, Tyler Norris, Vice President of Total Health Partnerships at Kaiser Permanente, and Laura Searfoss, a Policy Associate at the National Complete Streets Coalition, uh, a program of Smart Growth America. After those uh, national findings are discussed, we're going to hear from some of the communities that are featured in this new research. Uh, we're going to hear from Barbara Gray, Deputy Director of the Seattle Department of Transportation, Dean Ledbetter, the Senior Planning Engineer for Division 11 at the North Carolina Department of Transportation, Mayor Chris Coos, Mayor of uh, the Town of Normal, Illinois, and Jacob Stewart, President of the Central Florida Partnership. Uh, they're going to discuss why their communities created Complete Streets projects and what outcomes they've seen. Uh, I encourage everyone listening to participate in this conversation. Um, we are going to be presenting these findings, but we want to hear your feedback and ideas and questions for all of our speakers today. You can type your questions into the webinar screen, into the uh, questions box on your webinar screen if you're watching along on the web. And you can also uh, tweet at us on Twitter at the hashtag CompleteStreets or at our handle at SmartGrowthUSA. So to kick us off, I'd like to introduce Governor Paris Glendening, President of Smart Growth America's Leadership Institute. He's just going to provide a little bit of an overview about why we did this research. Governor Glendening? Alex, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me welcome everyone to the call. We're glad that you're here today and able to join us and talk about Complete Streets, our whole project and their outcome. When I was a Governor of Maryland, uh, we created uh, many street, uh, Complete Streets projects across the state. Uh, I remember the uh, tremendous work that was done in uh, downtown uh, Annapolis, both by my predecessor and our administration, uh, that uh, transformed that community just beautifully. Uh, probably one of the great success stories was Silver Spring, Maryland, which went from a sleepy uh, crosstown of, uh, of, of three uh, intersections to a major uh, community recognized now throughout the Mid-Atlantic states, and the start of that was Complete Streets. Uh, but we know that uh, Maryland isn't the only place to use this approach. Hundreds of communities across uh, the country are using complete streets uh, strategies. This report looks at the outcome of those projects. What we wanted to know was what communities have gotten for their investments. Uh, are they achieving the transportation goals? How do the costs compare to convention, con excuse me, conventional uh, transportation projects? And uh, how do those projects relate to broader economic uh, gains? You can hear uh, more about all these questions uh, during the panel presentations. Uh, but before we uh, dig into this uh, panel itself uh, and start to talk about the research, I'd like to introduce uh, Tyler Norris, the uh, Vice President of Total Health Partnerships at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we're very pleased Kaiser Permanente uh, funded this project. Uh, which adds to their already robust uh, research about the impact of complete streets uh, and the projects uh, across the country. Uh, I would just, as I turn o Tyler over to you, I would say uh, when I think about the communities I just mentioned, Annapolis and Silver Spring and others, uh, Bethesda and so on, uh, the thing that is most um, visual to me is not just the economic development uh, aspects of it, uh, but the people walking every place, uh, it seems like almost 24 hours a day, but uh, the great healthy walks that people are taking. So with that intro, uh, I, give it, I give you a pile of doors. Good morning, everyone. And Governor, thank you for that beautiful opening and the affirmation of walking as one of the most powerful things we can do for our health, uh, but also to create the kind of connectivity that makes for great communities and um, appreciate your leadership in all this. 
Um, my name is Tyler Norris. I lead the anchor institution work at Kaiser Permanente where we are looking at how we use our payroll and purchasing and our 600 plus facilities and our investment portfolio and all the resources of our organization to improve the health and um, equitable prosperity of our communities. Um, we were very pleased to be able to provide financial support for the study and the report and want to begin by congratulating the National Complete Streets Coalition, Smart Growth America and its staff teams and local and national partners for the great work here. In fact, not only for this report, but for the social entrepreneurship and the civic leadership and the field building that has been guided by these organizations for years, engaging our elected leaders and business communities and developers and planners in shaping our streets and the design of our communities in ways that not only improve health, but are more safe, provide greater mobility, especially for uh, populations with lower income and more vulnerable. It undergirds local economic development, <laughs> great places to be with others, and it shifts transportation modes in ways that are more affordable and reduce our carbon footprint. It's one of the most powerful co-benefit strategies in the nation today. As a nonprofit integrated delivery system that provides both care and coverage to our 10 million members in eight states, Kaiser Permanente's mission is to provide high quality affordable care and to improve the health of the communities we serve. So given that we're a health plan and a provider, which is a little different than most, we are at risk for the health of our members. So we're always looking at what advances the evidence base on measurable improvement of population health. And secondly, how do we implement strategies for behavior change that improve well-being when combined with policy systems and environmental change. And I view this as sort of supply and demand. We can have our physicians prescribe physical activity, 30 minutes a day for adults, 60 for kids, and they do that. We can build that demand, but if there's not a supply of safe routes and places to be active, it's going to limit what people do. And so we know we have to do both. Uh, and by getting people to be more active, we can start to reduce the preventable demand on the delivery system as a way to help make health care more affordable for everybody in this country. But when we started talking with Smart Growth America about this and the health benefits, we wanted to make sure we were looking at all of the complementary benefits for economics, mobility, and equity, which are also determinants of health. And so we're uh, looking forward to this as a springboard to the next chapter of the spread of complete streets, to the strengthening of the policies, and the deepening the national discourse for why this is so great for people, for communities, and the vitality of the United States of America. And so we're thrilled with this work, and I'll turn it uh, back to Alex Dodds at Smart Growth America. Thank you so much, Tyler. That's fantastic context for the report that we're going to be talking about and the research that we've done here. Um, we're really glad to be the home of the National Complete Streets Coalition and the groups that are sort of bringing together this conversation. We're really happy to be, to be playing that role. So now we're going to pivot a little bit and talk more specifically about the findings of today's research. And as I mentioned at the top of the uh, program, we, the uh, full research, the full document is available on our website at smartgrowthamerica.org if you haven't been there yet to down, download the full report. Now I'm going to turn it over to Laura Searfoff, develop, uh, uh, Policy Associate at the National Complete Streets Coalition. Laura was one of the people working on this project very closely over the last few months, and she's going to detail some of the um, more finer points of the, the research. Laura? Thanks, Alex. Um, as the Governor mentioned, Complete Streets policies have boomed in the past several years, and this has presented us with a great opportunity to look at the projects being implemented on the ground in communities of all sizes. These communities have made a commitment to consider all users, people traveling by foot, bicycle, transit, or car, of all ages and abilities through policy adoption, as well as by funding and building projects that reflect this approach. Um, Tyler did a great job leading us in um, and explaining the connection between healthy lifestyles and active transportation projects. Um, and I'm excited to share highlights from our new report, Safer Streets, Stronger Economies, which aims to answer the question, what do communities get for their investments in complete streets? To answer this question, um, a project team at Smart Earth America looked at complete streets both as a transportation investment, drawing conclusions from 37 built complete streets projects using before and after data collected primarily from local departments of transportation and public works, 
And we also analyzed a subset of these projects to understand their role in local economic development efforts. Here's what we learned from these projects. The first thing we learned is that the projects in our sample were typically safer after the complete streets redesign. In 70% of the projects, collisions fell. In about 53, 56, excuse me, percent of the projects, injuries fell. And as you can see from the figure on your screen, in some cases, these decreases were dramatic um, across projects. The cost of unsafe streets, as many of you know, are in the billions of dollars annually, both in terms of personal medical costs and property damages. So for every collision that these projects averted, they saved money. And we were able to quantify what that looks like. And across the projects profiled in this report, we found that in one year, these collision costs, um, $18.1 million were saved in collision costs. Now this may not seem like a large amount of money considering the high cost of unsafe streets, but for individual projects, these cost savings alone can often justify the project cost, in some cases several times over. Another major takeaway from these projects is that they encourage multimodal travel. Um, as Tyler mentioned, this is an important component of um, not only active lifestyles, but also making sure there is critical first and last mile connections that make um, particular transit trips possible. And what we found in the projects with available data was that trips by bicycle, foot, and transit nearly always increased after the installation of complete streets features. In terms of automobile volumes, we saw um, about half the projects carrying more automobiles following their redesign and about half carrying less, although in some projects, fewer cars was a design goal um, for the projects. The next major takeaway from these projects is how remarkably affordable they can be. Um, because most of the projects in this report were completed within the existing right-of-way, they were relatively inexpensive. The average cost of these projects was $2.1 million, far less than the average cost of projects found in most state transportation improvement plans carrying a price tag of $9 million. As you can see in the figure on your screen, when you also look at these project costs on a per mile basis, nearly all the projects in our sample cost less than an average high cost arterial roadway, which has a price tag of about $12.8 million, and about 75% cost less than the normal cost arterial at about $3.6 million. The projects that fall between um, the high and normal cost are often um, sort of can be categorized in two ways. So first, projects that have non-transportation goals like economic development or stormwater management and projects that close critical gaps in the transportation network. And this network is often where the real value of these individual projects are realized, often for a fraction of long-range transportation spending. And I encourage you to check out our full report for examples of communities getting whole bicycle and pedestrian networks for a bargain. The last takeaway is that these streets supported local economic development strategies. Um, what we found when we looked at a smaller set of projects, about 14 that we profiled within the report, we found in general that there was higher employment and property values, often outpacing similar unimproved corridors that we used as a comparison, as well as citywide trends. Um, the ones with, that reported net new businesses saw increases in all six cases. Higher retail sales in four and private investment was attracted to these sites in eight projects with information. Um, and you'll hear more uh, from our speakers about great examples um, of this in more detail um, in a little while. So taken together, when you consider the benefits um, on the transportation side, the low cost to achieve these benefits, and the role that Complete Streets can play in aiding economic development work, Complete Streets projects are some of the best transportation investments a community can make. This study is one of the first of its kind to catalog the tangible benefits of Complete Streets projects, and it relies on the best available data. Finding this data and analyzing it um, was often um, was one of the challenges throughout our analysis because many communities collect and report this information in different ways. Um, however, I hope that you are as excited about these results as we are. 
and we'll read about them more in our report. If you're wondering what your community can do to advance your work in similar ways, I strongly, strongly encourage you um, to evaluate and measure what your Complete Streets programs are delivering in the communities where you live and serve. You can use the data you already have as well as request additional data from other local departments, regional or state agencies, um, and keep a broad and open mind in considering the impacts because as Tyler mentioned, the co-benefits of Complete Streets are wide-reaching. Um, you can also engage residents and stakeholders in this process and, in a, and as you measure the benefits, you'll be able to build tangible local examples that inform Complete Streets work as well as build a base of support um, for future projects. And if you're interested in policy adoption, passing a Complete Streets policy, or considering new design guidance to help um, facilitate some of these designs that you see, um, two other ways that you can help um, support Complete Streets locally, I encourage you to visit the National Complete Streets Coalition's website. We have several resources to get you started. I hope you'll download the report and read about these highlights in more detail, and I look forward to your questions. And now I'll turn it over to Barbara Gray of the Seattle Department of Transportation. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be out here in Seattle. And uh, a little bit full circle for me, I was very involved in developing and implementing the uh, first Complete Streets Ordinance in Seattle in 2007. Um, we have been fortunate to have 37, uh, I think now 38 Complete Streets projects under our belt out here in Seattle, and um, have had a lot of great data that we've collected and a lot of great outcomes. So next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about our vision out here at SDOT. We um, are very, very interested in delivering a high quality transportation system for our diverse city. Um, we also have a new vision statement that I think uh, Complete Streets is really related to, which is connecting people, places, and products. And I think the previous speakers who have talked about the importance of health and the importance of connectivity on our streets and walking and biking and transit use, uh, that's all in our wheelhouse about connecting our people, places, and products. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach, about the types of tools that we've been able to use once we've freed up the right-of-way from a few extra travel lanes for vehicles, a couple of critical case studies, uh, Nickerson Northeast 125th Street, and then Northeast 75th, which we just got our data back yesterday, so I wanted to share that. The first two are highlighted in the Smart Growth Report as well as Stoneway, uh, which is another one that we did in about 2008. Um, we have a lot of before and after data and some other emerging economic studies that I've seen recently that I thought would be uh, interesting for people to contemplate. Next slide, please. Um, Vision Zero is, uh, you know, kicked off as a, an international movement. We've recently adopted our own Vision Zero strategy, and um, complete streets and right-sizing our roadways plays directly into our Vision Zero strategy. Our critical piece is about increasing safety, and so our right-sizing approach, uh, because nobody likes to be told to go on a diet, as you know, so we've changed our, our philosophy to right-sizing our streets rather than putting them on a road diet, um, is to increase safety by reducing speeds, collisions, and injuries, both their occurrence and severity, um, expanding mode choice, so really repurposing the right-of-way space for walking, cycling, and activation, and then doing all that while managing managing travel, uh, vehicular travel, but managing congestion at the intersections and really providing uh, great bike facilities and walking facilities as well. Next slide, please. Next one. Oh, thanks. So uh, the next three, this is just an example of one of our roadways and how you can overlay uh, the sort of in real time. Here's the existing four lanes. Next moving it to three lanes, so a two-way left turn and two dedicated bicycle lanes, and then looking at what this opportunity frees up in terms of crossing improvements. The first piece that I just showed is really just rubbing out old paint and putting down new paint. So in terms of the cost, it's pretty minimal. Next slide. And the kinds of opportunities that we have here for mid-block refuge islands, adding some aesthetic value, putting in clearly marked crosswalks to reduce uh, the potential for a multiple threat collision are just enormous, and we've seen some great results. Next slide. 
So some of the tools that we've been able to use here, some before and after uh, photos of real projects, the um, one on the left side of my screen, the before is Dexter Way. Uh, the after, we put in uh, bus lanes, uh, uh, excuse me, we put in uh, transit stops separated uh, with a bike lane so that we can really manage the bicycle travel for all ages and abilities. Same on the project on the right side. Next slide. Um, also great opportunities to put in protected bike lanes. We see a lot of green paint on our streets these days and a lot of different styles of how we're trying to give bicyclists a clear and dedicated right-of-way. Uh, in some cases we have two-way uh, protected bike lanes on one corridor. Um, in other cases it's just one, uh, one direction and the one on the right side separated by some jersey barrier which has really worked very well and is another low-cost solution. Next. Um, also, end of trip facilities. So we've been uh, very, I think, aggressive at working with local businesses to get bike corrals and, and rededicating parking spaces, so doing sort of the more acupuncture approach, um, as well as parklets following San Francisco's excellent model. Um, we've been building parklets, again, in partnership with local business. Uh, and very popular with local businesses. We've had a lot of interest and involvement, a lot of private uh, resources brought to bear for that program. So now I'm going to talk about three case studies. Next slide, please. Nickerson, Northeast 125th, and Northeast 75th. Next slide, please. I'll start by saying that democracy is alive and well in Seattle, and all of these projects have been enormously controversial at their start. Um, Nickerson was critical to, because we had some non-compliant crosswalks and some very significant safety challenges. Um, there's a college campus and a number of maritime industrial businesses along this corridor, as well as uh, robust uh, transit service and bicycle um, commute. Uh, uh, facilities and needs, and so uh, it was a street that really was in need of a remake, and safety drove our efforts here. Um, we uh, next slide, please. Some of the results on Nickerson, uh, which you will see sort of in the overall report, is that we had average speeds reduced. Um, by up to 24%. Um, and really the thing that we have found is the reduction in top end speeders. So those who are traveling up to 10 miles or more over the speed limit. In this case, Nickerson Street reduced that by almost 96%. I mean, it was, it was enormous. Um, and there has been very little reduction in travel time. This street is unique also in Seattle. We have a lot of bascule bridges, and so there's one at either end of this corridor. And so the traffic impacts during the rush hour when we have a lot of boat traffic re happen regardless of the corridor in between. So um, while there is still some traffic and still some cranky people, um, the project has been extremely successful. Next slide. Uh, so our uh, long-term our long-term goal, uh, aligned with Vision Zero, is to get to zero traffic fatalities by 2030. And this is exactly the kind of project that we uh, are going are continuing to undertake to hit that goal. Next slide, please. Northeast 25th is in a different part of the city, a much more, uh, much less um, developed part of the city. Uh, some would say rural in nature for a city like Seattle. The ADTs, or average daily traffic, was about 16,000. Again, this was a four-lane to two-lane conversion where we um, had some significant crossing issues, some really high-speed traffic, and uh, the four-lane section was just a detriment to um, community members who could not cross between sort of the two neighborhoods that were on either side of this corridor. Again. Uh, does could go through a business district. There's a lot of bus usage and uh, a really a lot of high speeds. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the outcomes were overall, again, safety improvements, speed reduction, reduction in collisions, um, and uh, to, I believe, uh, um, Tyler's point, the improvement uh, in bicycle activity and pedestrian activity was astounding. Uh, it really went up bicycles along the corridor. Um, went up significantly, as did people being able to walk in the crosswalks. Uh, this project was so controversial that it got pushed off a year uh, because of the irate community members who were just furious at the thought that they would be losing capacity. And so the, the counterintuitive nature of these uh, right-sizing projects is really, data really helps to change people's minds. So I think that's a critical piece of it. Next slide, please. 
Northeast 75th Street, um, about the same average daily traffic. We took uh, what was a high speed but relatively um, unstructured street through a residential neighborhood and gave it a lot more structure. We had a tragic uh, collision that resulted in two deaths and uh, some significant disabling injuries for a family uh, at this location last year um, and were able to move forward quickly with a right sizing approach. There's also a middle school in the neighborhoods and this one was controversial also because we removed a number of parking spaces which as most of you know is, is uh, verboten in many places. Um, next slide. Uh, again, we just got the data back yesterday. This is one year after we did the rechannelization. We've seen uh, a reduction in speeds and miles per hour. We've seen um, a reduction in speeders. And we've seen, again, a real reduction in those top end speeders who are going 10 miles plus over the speed limit. Next slide, please. We also did a community survey. Um, again, it was controversial, but because of the crash, things were uh, people were a lot more supportive of trying to move this forward. And we have seen um, strong support from the community that we made the right decision. 80% um, of the folks think the street is safer now after the rechannelization. There's a lot of support, and um, and I think we continue to work through our robust public outreach and design process and try to hit that critical balance of what's enough and what uh, slows the project down considerably. Next slide, please. So uh, in general, volume and safety drive a lot of our decisions for right sizing. I'm not going to go through all of this, but we do um, a fair amount of analysis. We do synchro modeling when the volume starts to creep up over 10,000 vehicles per day. Next slide, please. And then uh, 25,000 is about the limit. Uh, it's not to say that we wouldn't do a street over 25,000, but, but typically 25,000 is the max for us. Um, and we do some significant modeling, as well as modeling with all the vehicle types to ensure that you know, the large freight traffic that was a critical piece of the corridor on Nickerson could actually make their turns and get through. Next slide, please. Um, these are the data points that we analyze. Um, I think that I can't overemphasize the um, need to collect before and after data, regardless of how challenging it can be for some jurisdictions to have the time uh, and resources to collect that data. It is critical in convincing people that this approach works. Next slide, please. And um, here are just a sampling of about seven of our recent complete streets projects. And again, focusing on the aggressive speeders and how uh, each one of them has impacted um, aggressive speeding, as well as speeds in general, um, and how travel times have stayed relatively the same. They've either stayed the same, have increased just slightly, um, but the safety benefits far outweigh impacts and travel time reductions. Next. And then um, I know that we're talking a lot about economics. Um, I just recently saw a web posting. I have a link on my next slide. It is about, it's from uh, City Lab uh, looking at a sampling of um, jurisdictions who are addressing the economics of mode shift. There's still a lot more research that needs to be done. I think the research that Smart Growth has done to support this line of thinking is tremendous. I just pulled a couple of them from the West Coast here uh, where Portland, Oregon ana analyzed uh, the amount of uh, resource that cyclists spend versus people driving in cars to different types of retail establishments. And while cyclists, cyclists may spend less per trip, they make more trips overall. Um, and then in Seattle, Washington, Kyle Rowe, who's on our staff here did uh, a, uh, a research report looking at cycling infrastructure and how it's had uh, no discernible negative impact and in some cases showed an increase in retail sales. Um, again, much more research needs to be done, I think, to draw uh, repeatable conclusions here. But um, I would encourage you, next slide, to take a look at the, um, oh, it's on the next slide, but to take a look at the City Lab article for just kind of an, a quick overview. So our lessons learned, right sizing works. We have uh, a lot of completed examples in Seattle and good results from all of them. Um, I've talked about the top end speeders. The pedestrian and bicycle safety and access is tremendous. It has affected a mode share shift on the corridors that we've seen especially giving pedestrians more access. Um, and uh, I, I can't overemphasize enough how controversial these projects were, uh, all the way up to the mayor and our city council. Uh, in the case of Nickerson, the state legislature got involved. Um, and so again, the before and after studies were critical to, to letting people know that we were paying attention to safety and that we were um, going to, uh, to get a better outcome. Next slide. 
So our home page, web page at seattle.gov has a lot of information. We also rely heavily on the NACTO guides, the FHWA countermeasures, and here's that City Lab article on the complete business case for converting streets parking into bike lanes. Next slide. And that's all for me. I'm going to turn it over to Dean Ledbetter uh, from uh, in North Carolina DOT. Great. Thank you, Barbara. It's a pleasure to be with you all today to discuss some of the wonderful things that we've done in West Jefferson. Um, my first slide, if you'll advance, uh, there we go. First slide is a, a map to give you an idea of where West Jefferson is located. It's in the northwest corner of the state where we border with Tennessee and with Virginia. And as you can see from the next slide, West Jefferson is a small mountain town with a, a very compact downtown area. West Jefferson's a, a former furniture town. It's been uh, seen a decline in some of the traditional manufacturing over the years, but has had an increase in some specialized manufacturing recently. To supplement the manufacturing, uh, the air is relying more and more on tourism. And the next picture shows uh, one of several Bin Long frescoes uh, in the area. Uh, Mr. Long came to Ashe County to paint some frescoes in two churches in the 1980s, and tourists began to come to the area to see the frescoes. And many of those tourists ended up buying second homes and, and moving to the area, including a number of artists. So we ended up with a, a fairly active arts community in downtown West Jefferson, but it just wasn't enough to keep the downtown area thriving. So we saw buildings sitting vacant and, and deteriorating. So the town worked with a design school at NC State University to complete a, a downtown design charrette to give them a vision for what they wanted their downtown to look like. They started implementing some of the ideas from, from that charrette. The next slide shows one of the, the nicer improvements that they did. Uh, this wall was, was placed in front of a storage area for a, a building supply store, and that, that building supply store was right beside the major uh, tourist destination in downtown, which is Ash County Cheese. It's North Carolina's only cheese factory. So this wall shielded the, the view of those stored materials. The next slide shows the, the biggest improvement they did. Uh, they, they worked with the local high school students to design, cut the metal, weld, and, and fabricate these things. Uh, these were three large milk tanks, just white industrial looking milk tanks in a gravel area. They landscape, they, they turn these into cows, and now everybody who comes to town wants to get their, their selfie made with the cows. They also worked with their, their local electric co-op. They got rid of some, some overhead street lights, uh, replaced them with some more attractive pedestrian level type lighting. They buried some of their overhead utilities. But the, the next slide shows what was really missing from town, and that was their streetscape. Uh, this is the concept that was developed by NC State University students uh, many years earlier and had never been implemented, mainly because of the cost of, of implementing it was more than the town could handle. So when the town learned in, in 2010 that North Carolina was going to be resurfacing Jefferson Avenue, they came to us and talked about the possibility of including their streetscape elements in the resurfacing project. While that was not a possibility, we did have a very good discussion with town staff about some of the traffic issues that the town was facing, namely traffic speed and noise in the downtown area. And the next slide will give you an idea of, of why that traffic was moving so fast. There was just nothing there to, to slow them down. Uh, nice wide open streets, but uh, not, not very conducive to pedestrian travel. So the first thing that our staff recommended was to remove a couple of unwarranted traffic signals in the downtown area along Jefferson Avenue. And we explained to the town the, the potential benefits that would come from removing the signals and replacing them with always stops and then adding some additional mid-block crosswalks. And you can see from the next slide some of the, the pedestrian challenges that the town faced with narrow sidewalks and long crossing distances. So the Department of Transportation offered the town up to $250,000 in funding for their streetscape plans in exchange for the town's support of, of our removal of the unwanted traffic signals. Uh, the town staff was very interested in the proposal, agreed to go back and discuss it with other stakeholders in the community. So we met with the Department of, uh, or with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the local Chamber of Commerce, and a representative from the State Department of Commerce. The Chamber Director immediately saw the benefits of the plans, began talking to some of the business owners. And when DOT and the town's consultant gave a presentation to the town board of aldermen requesting a resolution of support, we had 21 business owners show up with stickers 
that read vote yes to DOT. So one important part of that conversation was the concern by some of the town aldermen about tractor trailer access. And we simply addressed that by asking the question if they believe that the future of West Jefferson depended more on tractor trailers or more on pedestrians. And when they all agreed it depended more on pedestrians, then we asked the question of why we would design our downtown around tractor trailers instead of those pedestrians. So we got the board's approval and the night they passed the resolution, the milling machine was actually working on Jefferson Avenue right in front of Town Hall. And the next slide shows what happened three nights after that meeting. Next slide. As, as soon as the resurfacing was complete, uh, the traffic signals were removed. When we removed the signals, we used paint to create some bulb outs. We installed stop, stop signs directly into the pavement at the bulb out areas. And within two weeks, we went back, talked to business owners, and they were reporting some noticeable improvement. Traffic speeds were lower, traffic noise was down, motors were yielding to the pedestrians more regularly, and the pedestrians reported feeling safer. But people were very quick to say that as drivers, they did not like the, the stop signs, but as pedestrians, they could certainly see the benefits. So once the temporary signals were in, or temporary devices were in place, the town was awarded a federal grant through their local health district to pay for some design work for the streetscape, and, and that was a $30,000 grant that they received. And the next picture shows part of the finished product. The total cost of the project was $380,000. The town's portion ended up being about $140,000. And the next slide will show some of the, the change that resulted. Uh, we, we now have a, a downtown that's designed around people. Uh, next slide. There we go. Uh, and, and I have to admit, I was not always a believer in complete streets. Uh, my focus as a traffic engineer was always on motor vehicles, intersection capacities, things like that. But over a period of several years, I attended a series of pedestrian safety training courses provided by the Federal Highway Administration. And I went from thinking that complete streets were a crazy idea to feeling like we just had to find a place to, to try those ideas. Uh, next slide. Our primary focus at the beginning of this project was simply the removal of unwarranted traffic signals. We, we knew that the always stops would create a better environment and atmosphere in town, but honestly what our biggest concern was was the cost as a division of maintaining so many unwarranted traffic signals across our eight counties. We, we knew that if we could demonstrate some success in West Jefferson that other towns would be more willing to, to try the same types of things. So we knew it would be good for traffic, we knew it would be good for pedestrians, and we knew if people gave it a chance that they would really love the new atmosphere. But the next slide shows what we didn't imagine. And in two years, West Jefferson saw 10 new businesses open in downtown. And with these new businesses came 56 new jobs and over $500,000 in private investment in building improvements. And as you can see in the next slide, it also brought people. There was a significant increase in the number of visitors at the Chamber of Commerce office on Jefferson Avenue. In, in two years after the project, we saw a 14% increase in the, the late summer and early fall months. In the month of September, which is the peak of, of leaf season, we actually had a 27% increase in, in visitors at the chamber. And the chamber ended up extending their hours on Friday and Saturdays. Instead of closing it at 5 p.m., they, they started uh, keeping their offices open until 8 p.m. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, this, this area that you're seeing was three parking spaces that were taken in to, to create a little seating area, and that's right in front of a, a beauty shop, and she was very excited to lose the parking spaces and, and have a place for people just to congregate in front of her business. Uh, but now our division is, uh, we firmly believe in complete streets. We've seen the traffic benefits. We've seen the, the quality of life benefits. We've seen the economic benefits. As a result of the West Jefferson Project, we worked with many other towns in our division to implement same type of ideas. One visit to West Jefferson is all it takes for folks to, to realize this is what they want their towns to look like. We've removed over a dozen unwarranted traffic signals now, which, which gives us money and manpower opportunities to, to do other things in our division. And the last slide is my contact information. I would love to hear from anybody who, who has any questions about what we've done in West Jefferson and, and would like to just close by saying how rewarding it's been for us to, to know that we're making a difference in our communities and that we're making those communities a better place for the people who live in them. 
And now I'm going to turn it over to Mayor Chris Coos from the town of Normal, Illinois. Thank you, Dean. Um, um, I am the uh, mayor of the town of Normal, Illinois. Um, I've been mayor for about 12 years uh, in the community. Um, I like to tell people I'm the only normal mayor in the United States. You could look that up. Um, and um, in my private life, I uh, have owned and operated a, a bike shop and a running specialty store for 40 years in the community. So you could say I kind of dropped from the political womb uh, with a, a, a strong notion of complete streets and their importance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an aerial view of our community, our downtown area, which we did a renovation project on. This is from 1962. Uh, and it shows a kind of a mishmash of streets, and, uh, and most of that is a result of uh, uh, the two railroads that run through the community, um, as, as shown on the slide. Uh, the Illinois Central Railroad is now Constitution Trail, a rails-to-trails uh, trail network within our community. And the Chicago and Alton Railroad line is now the Chicago-St. Louis High-Speed Rail Corridor, a uh, very important piece of, of what we've done in our community. Next slide, please. This is a street version uh, view uh, from 1900s. And if you were here today, uh, you'd recognize most of those buildings. They're still with us. Although, unfortunately, uh, like many communities in the United States, the streetcar line went away in the 1920s. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, some of the building stock we have in our community. And uh, if you were in our community today, you would identify that building. It looks very much uh, the same as it did then. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Normal is Midwestern uh, Illinois. Um, you can see the location there. Um, uh, on the map, we are on the uh, Chicago-St. Louis uh, High-Speed Rail Corridor, uh, which is under construction at this, mo at this time um, and will probably be done in about 18 months when we'll have pretty active high-speed rail on that corridor. Currently, we do have 10 trains a day that go from uh, Chicago uh, to St. Louis and one long-haul train, uh, the Texas Eagle, that goes from Chicago to San Antonio. Uh, we're adjacent to Illinois State University. It's a uh, university of about 21,000 students, 3,500 faculty and staff. Uh, most, a lot of our planning uh, for this project was done with those people in mind. Uh, next slide, please. So in, uh, in, tonight, in the year 2000, we decided uh, to look at a bold new vision for our community. And um, what we did pre actually predated the Complete Streets movement. And when we started seeing some of those protocols later, when, when those came out, we realized that we'd, we'd actually done that before there was a complete streets movement. Um, an interesting fact is that when we looked at our community uh, uh, in the core of our uptown district, uh, about 32% uh, of the total land mass was uh, street right-of-way. And we thought, and here's an opportunity to do something with that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide shows uh, a reconfiguration of that messy traffic pattern I referred to earlier. Uh, we incorporated a roundabout to deal with those, uh, those uh, connecting uh, streets to move traffic um, and to accommodate pedestrians um, and bicycle traffic through our, uh, our uptown. What we had done is we narrowed the streets, uh, widened the sidewalks, um, and um, uh, we found that um, our pedestrian traffic and our, our cycling traffic especially uh, increased uh, significantly. Uh, the whole design was uh, designed to be bike and, and pedestrian friendly, uh, but respecting that the automobile has a place in, in the community and in, in a central business district. Um, you can see in this drawing, uh, uh, one of the elements of the circle is the uh, the refuge islands uh, in the circle that um, allow people to move pretty easily uh, on foot through our uh, uptown area in the circle. Uh, this circle also represents a major stormwater tool, and that's a conversation for another day, but it's a very innovative uh, uh, stormwater management tool that uh, has uh, garnered national attention. Next slide, please. So you can see uh, from these slides, uh, the, the activity that, that happens as a result of uh, 
of, of making a place more pedestrian and bicycle friendly. Um, lots of uh, activity in our, in our uptown area. Um, and um, next slide, please. Uh, you can see here in some of these pictures the widened sidewalks, although the picture to the left shows some uh, outdoor tables that are not occupied. Uh, in good weather, uh, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, street activity. Uh, almost all the restaurants have uh, uh, on, 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 on sidewalk uh, dining areas they take advantage of. People love it, uh, and it's drawn quite a few people into our community. Next slide, please. Um, just an example, this is a, a pre-redevelopment. This is a, a small uh, restaurant. And uh, next slide, please. Um, this is what it became, um, um, a different cafe. You'll notice um, a lot of uh, street plantings, uh, trees, and, and shrubs, which really enhance uh, the walkability of the community. And, and kind of give it a little refuge from uh, um, people on the sidewalk for, and cars in the street. Next slide, please. Uh, when we did the uptown area, we uh, uh, put in a significant amount of bicycle parking, and we quickly found that we did not put enough in. Uh, people were showing up, and uh, uh, our bike parking was kind of overwhelmed, so we had to put more in. On the left here, you see an example of uh, one parking place that was uh, taken out in front of a coffee shop and a restaurant. Uh, so when you give up one space um, for uh, one car, and you get parking now for uh, eight people in, in that same space. And on the right is a, is a covered uh, bike parking area um, in the uptown area. And adjacent to that is a uh, fix-it station, which has become very popular. It gets used all the time. Basically, it's a little kiosk area with a bike stand and some tools so that people uh, in the uptown area can work on their bikes. Um, also, uh, because Constitution Trail is a significant part um, of the community, it, it, it goes right through the heart of um, Uptown Normal and through the uh, traffic circle there, um, um, bringing a lot more bike traffic into the community. Uh, a major part uh, of our redevelopment project was this building, which is Uptown Station. It's a, a, a facility that accommodates uh, Amtrak um, passenger rail, regional buses, um, shuttle buses to O'Hare and Midway airports in Chicago. Again, Constitution Trail goes right by this building. Uh, and it serves local bus traffic as well. So uh, it's been a huge success and has generated uh, a lot of activity in, in the uptown area. Next slide, please. So what did we find as a result of all this uh, redevelopment? Um, well, one thing we found was that our retail sales increased by about 46% from the start of the project to today. Uh, we currently uh, do not have any available real estate in our uptown area, and this is, this is a problem because we have quite a waiting list of people who want to move into the, into the uptown area to, to open businesses. Um, we put, spent about $23 million in public infrastructure. That sounds like a lot of money, but uh, that included uh, uh, sewer re all sewer replacements, uh, water main replacements. Uh, it included road realignments, new street surfaces, um, because we did narrow the streets, uh, new sidewalks throughout the area. But this generated about $165 million of private investment in our community. Um, new buildings, uh, multi-use buildings, uh, a hotel, a second hotel under construction, um, and generating quite a bit of economic activity. Uh, through our counts of pedestrian counts and, and bicycling counts, we've seen a 40% increase in bicycle and pedestrian traffic in this area. Our Amtrak ridership is up more than 25%. Uh, since um, 2011. Our regional bus ridership is up more than 80%, and our local transit use is up 40% throughout the community since uh, 2011. We've also seen about a 16% um, increase in uh, uh, private property values as, as part of this project. Uh, we're taking some of the lessons we learned from this and apply, trying to apply it um, um, throughout the community. We have a Main Street corridor in our communities that connects Bloomington and Normal, a seven-mile corridor, which we've done a study on. Um, 
uh, which uh, we're going to apply complete street standards to. And we've also implemented a, a community-wide bicycle and um, master uh, bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Um, a previous speaker talked about how these these projects can be challenging, uh, new things to people, uh, represented challenge, the fear of the unknown, and so you know you have to fight these battles almost block by block as you build out these complete street projects. Uh, tenacity is a, a much needed attribute to, to make these projects happen and um, we've found that it's not an either or proposition. You either do one or the other. But, uh, we've proven here in our uptown redevelopment that multiple modes of transportation can coexist and proves to be safer for everyone. So that's kind of our, our community in a nutshell, and right now I'd like to turn this over to Jacob Stewart from the Central Florida Partnership. Thank you, Mayor. And Mayor, I'm delighted to now know the, the source of the beautiful co cover photograph on the report. So that's your city. That is my community, yes. Thank wow. you. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, invited to participate today, although I'm the least knowledgeable of all this wonderful work. Um, and I want to congratulate the speakers and the communities that have come before me. Um, I serve as president of the Central Florida Partnership, which in many ways is like the Chamber of Commerce. And I've been doing this work for almost 30 years. Coincidentally, Edgewater Drive, the city that has been highlighted as a case study in the report is a city on which I, a city street on which I grew up. And in fact, it's not even 200 yards away f from the office building in, I, in which I now sit. Uh, what happened there on Edgewater Drive it was a very positive, positive movement for this wonderful neighborhood. But it did not come without controversy. Uh, Orlando is the center city of a region of 4 million people with 86 cities and welcomes 60 million visitors a year to our family of communities. And safety is becoming more and more important to all of our neighborhoods. Edgewater Drive, the case study is anchored on one end by one of uh, Florida's mega high schools of almost 4,000 students, and at the other end, just not even two miles away, is a beautiful downtown lake. Uh, Edgewater Drive is populated with uh, growing churches and growing businesses. And as a result of the renovations done on Edgewater Drive, which essentially uh, reduced the traffic lanes from four to three, it resulted in exactly what the other speakers have talked about. We see a reduction in accidents and an increase in walkability. Uh, the bike lanes really have encouraged new modes of transportation. And the big change for this particular neighborhood in Central Florida is increased property values. And the increased property values are driven not just by the wonderful things happening on Edgewater Drive, but the things happening around Edgewater Drive. And that's new housing, that is uh, high density housing, and improvements to existing housing. And so what's happened in the real estate values, it has come up by 80% 80 80 since the renovation of Edgewater Drive. A remarkable case study for the favorable. In addition, it's created jobs. The new businesses up and down Edgewater Drive have created 77 net new businesses, creating 500 new jobs. And so all in all, it's been a wonderful laboratory of excellence here in this neighborhood. And we are very proud to have been highlighted by this report. So it's now my pleasure to turn it, um, it back to Alex. And so Alex, I'll listen to you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jacob, and to all of our panelists for talking about your experiences, and uh, to Laura and the whole team here for talking about the findings. We're going to open the floor up now for some Q&A, and we want to hear from everyone listening. You can type your questions into the chat window uh, on the webinar screen, or you can tweet on Twitter at the hashtag CompleteStreets. We just have a few minutes left, uh, so I'm going to try to do this rapid fire. Um, but the first question is for Laura. Can you just give a couple of examples 
um, I, it was a question that we got at the very beginning um, from one of our listeners of what the projects built and how much those things cost. Just a, a quick sort of summary of that. Sure. So the projects in our sample of 37 uh, complete streets improvements really ranged everything from um, road diets, I know people balk at that word, um, where the paint was grinded off and that cost about $10,000 in one community, um, everything to major road reconstruction and reconfigurations. Um, the projects that I highlighted in the, in the PowerPoint on the figure on a cost per mile basis, which is how we're able to compare costs across projects, uh, range from 61000 to uh, 12 million per mile. So some were relatively inexpensive um, in terms of total project costs, um, and some were uh, much more so expensive. Um, but there's really no sort of one thing or one activity that encapsulates the designs that were done. I guess this question came up after, Barbara, your discussion um, of the, just the simple paint application that was mm -hmm. qualified as one of the projects. Um, and you, I have another question for you, Barbara, which is that you mentioned that the, some of the projects were really unpopular at the beginning or people had a lot of concerns. Can you talk a little bit about how those opinions changed if they did? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll focus a little bit on Nickerson Street because that was the one. Um, it impacted um, maritime businesses and also we have a lot of reconfiguration happening to our roadway with our uh, downtown waterfront project and uh, the um, changes uh, to truck access to some of our maritime industrial areas. So those were the folks that were really most concerned. Um, the pedestrian safety was a huge factor for many in the college campus and the residents, but there was just the pervasive fear that traffic was going to get out of control. Um, and so uh, they brought these issues after we did a fair amount of public outreach and engagement with people and talked through the challenges. And that was very helpful just to give people some data and also to give them some context. But ultimately the mayor got involved and uh, had a number of advisory committee meetings to really hear people out um, and ultimately listened and weighed the options, looked at other cities, looked at other projects that we had done, and, um, and moved forward as I think um, Mayor Coos from uh, Normal Illinois said it, it was really, we, we had to kind of take that leap. He had to be very willing politically to take that leap and move forward and again got some additional feedback from uh, a couple of members of the um, our state legislature. But ultimately, once the project opened, all of the negative voices largely calmed down. We still get a couple of, uh, you know, we've made some tweaks too. So one of the values of doing these projects uh, cheaply, they certainly don't have the same kind of impact and effect as some of the wonderful projects that we've seen in, in other areas, although we do have some higher end projects. But um, you can tweak them a little bit too where they don't work uh, and it's not, it's not as challenging to do so when it's just paint um, and some reconfiguration of roadway space. Great, absolutely. So my next question or the next question from our listeners is to you, Dean, um, about West Jefferson, North Carolina. You said that uh, you wanted to be able to show other communities that these crazy ideas, and I'm using air quotes that you can't see, uh, mm -hmm. that these crazy ideas could work, these complete streets ideas. Um, what's been your experience talking to other DOTs about complete streets work? Well, it's certainly been varied. Um, you know, coming from a traffic engineering background, most of my fellow traffic engineers thought I was crazy when we did this. We did this without doing much study ahead of time because we just didn't have the time. Uh, but certainly people have been able to see it, see it being successful, and, and you always end up with that comment of, but it won't work in my town. And <laughs> what we've done is just brought people here let them experience it and, and then go back to their towns and, and try to envision it there. Uh, so we, we've seen quite a few cities and towns from all over the state come to visit West Jefferson because of the popularity of this project. And we, we've seen some positive newspaper articles as far away as West Virginia uh, talking about the, the, the nice town that West Jefferson has become. And, and that really is what sells it more than the traffic side of things. So if you want to see Complete Streets in Action, Dean Ledbetter will give you a personal tour <laughs> of West Jefferson. Just to go there. <laughs> um, and I think probably any of the communities that we're talking about here and who are on our call today would be great examples to go and visit to see these principles in action. Um, Mayor Coos, I have a quick question for you. 
Listener Gary loves the awnings in Downtown Normal and wants to know who funded and maintains them. Um, I'm assuming he's talking about the awnings uh, over the buildings. Uh, yeah, I think it's sort of a, a shared space. You know, some of this is sort of obviously part of the sidewalks or the shared space of the city. You know, how do you negotiate, I guess, the shared maintenance of that stuff between uh, the businesses and the city? Actually, most of the businesses do that on their own. Uh, yeah. We did have some facade grants uh, to help some of the smaller businesses early on um, do some of these projects, uh, but um, they tend to take them on, on for themselves. Uh, they're, they're very active uh, signs, and, and given the sun orientation, uh, if you're on the uh, north side of the street, you really need those awnings for your business. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, well, my final question then is going to be for Jacob. Um, it comes from one of our listeners who asks, um, what advice would you give to business leaders or business owners in, in communities where complete streets projects are being proposed? How would you encourage them to think about these, these issues? Well, a, a civic engagement is the way for it to work. But it is, it's important, I think, for our elected leaders and our appointed officials to understand the concerns that come, come to mind when business owners and homeowners raise concerns. I think the openness with which this project was advanced was a, a great credit to the mayor and the city commissioners at the city of Orlando by engaging in a thoughtful conversation around the neighborhood, around the businesses. Um, and, and I think that is the important thing. I heard a speaker earlier uh, in the program say that, you know, that the research and the facts dominate. But really, in fact, sometimes in these decisions, it's the emotions that dominate. And so I think we need to encourage uh, both sides, so to speak, those who are elected and appointed to serve our needs, and then those whose needs are served to really engage in these conversations as early as possible, using this report and the examples cited as uh, case studies of success. I think the report uh, uh, for safer streets and stronger economies is really a great, great example of how communities can work together to strengthen themselves. Well, if I could have asked for a more perfect way to end this conversation. I don't think I could have gotten something better than that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so many more questions, unfortunately, uh, from our listeners that I'm not going to be able to answer because of time. Um, we will do our best to answer them in a follow-up blog post on our website. Uh, you can see those answers as well as a recording of this event uh, later this week. And next week, um, we're going to have another event which folks might be interested in. One of the recommendations that we talk about in this report is that there was just not enough places that have collected data about Complete Streets projects. We were able to find many, but we would have loved to find many more. Um, we're going to be hosting another webinar next Tuesday, same time, same bat channel. Um, Tuesday at 1 p.m., if you go to our website, smartgrowthamerica.org slash complete streets, you'll see information about it there all about collecting data from Complete Streets projects and measuring the impact of these projects. Uh, at this time, I just want to say thank you again to all of our speakers. And if you haven't already, you can download the full report today at smartgrowthamerica.org. And that, with that, we will conclude. Thank you so much, everyone.